if you're still hoping for the turnaround in Zoom, the Facebook, Tesla, that ship has sailed. That was the previous bull market. The current bear market has marked the end of that bull market. Think about what the next bull market is going to be. It's not going to be in the same place. Lightning never strikes twice in the same area. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and on today's episode, I am joined by Louis Vincent Gov. Louis, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Very nice to meet you, Rebecca. It's great to have you here. I spoke with your friend David Hay a little bit ago, and he recommended I get you on the show. So I'm really excited for this conversation and getting your macro outlook right now. Your firm, GavCal, is one of the leading providers of global investment research. And so to start things off today, I thought it'd be really helpful to just kind of hear your current outlook for the global economy and for financial markets. Oh, well, <laughs> that could take an hour and a half right there. Um, look, it's, uh, it's, it's very nice to meet you. Look, I think right now things are uh, obviously pretty challenging. We've just had uh, three negative quarters for equities and three negative quarters for bonds. That's a highly unusual combination. So I think most people are licking wounds. And that's even before you, before you even go into uh, what real estate is doing or what cryptos are doing. Um, there's basically been very, very few places to hide. And, you know, I think this reflects both some very important structural shifts in our economy from a deflationary world to an inflationary world itself, the result of a, of a number of factors that maybe we'll have time to get into. And, you know, some more cyclical stuff, you know, central banks tightening, economic growth slowing down in most major economies, therefore far more hurdles on, uh, far more headwinds on earnings. Now, you know, I think before we get, it'd be very easy to, to get very despondent, right? It'd be very easy to paint a very bleak picture and to think, okay, things, things are going to be terrible. Maybe before we do, we should take a deep breath and, and remember that markets don't go up in a straight line. They don't go down in a straight line. Uh, so at least in the near term, the potential, I think, for a rally, even if, you know, not a new bull market, but a rally is uh, is there. It's it's pretty unusual that you get four negative quarters in a row for either equities and bonds even more so. So the, the potential for, you know, if only just a, a, a bit of a breather. And then you get to the question of, you know, what, what could be the catalyst for for a change in the trend? And right now, you know, everybody's focusing on the catalyst as the Fed pivot. It's the, the big buzzword of the day. When, do, when does the Fed basically stop strangling the markets? You know, I focus on a completely different part of the world. I spend most of my time looking at, uh, at Asia, looking at China especially. And so for, for me, the potential catalyst is actually not a Fed pivot, but a Xi Jinping pivot. You know, for, for two and a half years, China has been on lockdown following crazy zero COVID policies. The big question for me is, you know, does this continue over the next 12 months or does this start to shift? If obviously China uh, was unleashed, then I think you'd probably see a rebound in growth in China. And with that, a rebound in probably in, in a number of fairly beaten up assets. I think who knows when this is going to happen, but the odds of it happening between right now, which is the party Congress uh, and Chinese New Year uh, for me are not zero. Uh, and it's not zero because the, there's starting to be a big social cost to the zero COVID. To cut a long story short, I think Chinese people are sick of it. Uh, you saw that in the last two city lockdowns that you saw in Shenzhen and Chengdu, basically had riots in the streets. So I think the ability of the Chinese government to keep locking down their population is starting to wear thin. If you start to see the Chinese government back off, this could be a spot of positive news where in a world where you're really lacking, sorely lacking, positive news. Maybe I'm clutching at straws, but uh, looking, look, trying to look for the, uh, the silver lining to, to, this, to these dark clouds that, uh, that are mounting overhead right now. I want to dive deeper into your outlook on China in a little bit. I kind of want to stay on the U.S. economy first because we know we're in a bear market and the rally, it might sustain, it might not. We're down about 20% from the peak in the S&P 500. And some experts are still debating if we're in a recession or not, even though the data is pretty clear we've contracted. But I guess I'm just wondering, do you think the market is has already priced in a recession or has it not? And then if that data comes out, we could see further corrections. 
I don't think it has. Well, let's put it this way. Let's look at the market PE. I think the PE has definitely contracted, right? So the, the PE is probably about right. Uh, my fear is the E is not right. So if there is a recession, the E is not right. If there is a recession, we have an, a whole other cycle of earnings downgrade to, uh, to go through. Uh, and the cycle of earnings downgrade is, is another 20%. Uh, lower in the market. And I think you've seen this spontaneously in different companies, companies that, you know, have come out and announced disappointing earnings, whether you're Federal Express, your Nikes, your Ford Motors, they basically get dragged out and shot, right? And as the stock price goes down 15 to 20. In a recession, you get just a lot more of those. So to answer your question directly, the market correction, I think, anticipates a slowdown. That's the correction we've seen in the PE. The PE is right. The big question is the E right. And here, my big fear is the big theme of 2023 will actually be earnings downgrades. That's really interesting. I think a lot of our listeners right now might be wondering, is this kind of a good time to buy the dip? We often hear these are once in a lifetime opportunities to have these types of downturns. Or should we still be thinking this is a time to be defensive because 2023 could get worse? So I think bear markets are there for a reason. They're not fun, obviously. Nobody, you know, we all like bull markets better. They're a lot more exciting. Bear markets are there for a reason. Big bear markets, like the ones where, because we are now in a big bear market. This is not a correction. Corrections, you buy the dip. Bear markets, doing a bear market is you wonder where's the next leadership going to come from? I think the tendency of most investors when they're in a bear market is to hold on to the past cycles winners to say, Oh, you know what? I bought Peloton here. Or I bought zoom communications here, or I bought Facebook there. Uh, and it's going to come back because these are good companies and they're going to come back over time. But the reality is bear markets are there for a reason. And that's to change leadership from one group of stock to the next. So while you're in a bear market, what you should actually be doing is thinking, okay, where is the next leadership going to come from? And the, the best way to, to do that is to actually look at within, while you're going through the bear market, who is already outperforming? Who's already starting to shine? And today I would say there's, there's really two asset classes that are starting to shine. The first asset class is energy. Pretty much anything linked to energy has been outperforming. And the second asset class that's been uh, outperforming uh, is emerging markets, especially if you exclude China. Uh, which is such a big part of the emerging market benchmark. But if you look at your Brazils, your Indias, your Indonesias, your South Africas, your Mexicos, all these markets are flat to up for the year, you know, which is dumbfounding. In, in an environment of rising interest rates, of strong U.S. dollar, that these markets are actually flat to up for the year goes against any historical precedent. So I think there's a very strong message in both the outperformance of energy, you know, energy outperforming during an economic slowdown and in the emerging market outperformance. To me, it tells me that the next bull market will focus on those two, on uh, maybe both or either of these, on, or at least one of these two sectors. So in these two sectors, I want to buy the dip. You know, when I see energy dipping, yep, I'll buy that. But the reality is you're wasting your time and more importantly, you're wasting your capital if you're you know, still hoping for the turnaround in Zoom, the turnaround in Facebook, the turnaround in Tesla, that, that ship has sailed. It's gone. That was the previous bull market. The current bear market has marked the end of that bull market. Think about what the next bull market is going to be. It's not going to be in the same place. It never is. Lightning never strikes twice in the same area. That's really interesting. I've kind of heard that similar trend and perspective from a few guests now. So it seems like it's quite consistent among a lot of people. And so I'm just wondering about the energy piece. So it has appreciated a lot over the past year or so. And so right now, would you say that it's kind of at an overvalued level and that, yeah, investors should wait a little bit if it were to go down or that's not important because it's in this new cycle? So first, it's not important because it's in this new cycle. But to your point, I think your listeners need to know that there's fundamentally three ways to make money in financial markets. You can run some type of momentum trade, i.e., you know, things are going up, so I buy it. And, you know, I think a lot of investors during the COVID years, et cetera, became momentum investors, right? It's like, oh, Zoom communication is going up. I'll buy that. So, and, and it works. It can work for a very long time. Some people are very good at identifying trends and writing them. 
Today, we've started a trend in, in energy. So you have the positive momentum. Now, you mentioned overvaluation. That's the second way you can make money in financial markets is you want to return to the mean trade. You buy things that are undervalued or buy things that are oversold and you ride them until the, you know, they, they become overvalued. Now, I don't think energy is overvalued, not by a long shot. You know, I look at things like the coal miners in the US, for example, are trading at two, three times earnings. They're buying back 10% of their shares a year. They're far, far, far from being undervalued, uh, overvalued. And same story with a lot of the oil companies. I mean, if you look, you're, you're based in Canada. If you look at some of the Canadian oil stocks, you, took a, you take a tourmaline, you take a, uh, a Suncor. These are not expensive stocks. These are actually cash flow generating machines. Now, historically, and this is what makes it for me, energy particularly interesting this, in this cycle. Historically, you know, your typical oil company CEO, when he gets money, the first thing he does is he goes drill a hole in the desert because otherwise you wouldn't be an old CEO. You know, that's what they do. Get money, drill holes. Here, all of a sudden, the, your oil company CEO, nobody's drilling. Nobody's doing any capital spending. And the reason he's not drilling is because he's got governments telling him, in five years, I want you out of business. So, you know, why is he going to do a big capital spending plan that comes due in three years? Why is he going to build a new refinery? Why is he going to build pipelines? He can't even get environmental approval for it. So now he's generating amazing cash flows and he really has no choice but to give these cash flows back to shareholders, either through special dividends or through share buybacks, which brings me to the third way you make money. Uh, the third way you make money is by running some kind of carry trade, by basically having assets who always generate higher payments than whatever your cost of capital is. What is very unique about energy and to some extent emerging markets, but especially energy today, is that it ticks all three boxes. They're positive momentum trades, they're positive return to the mean trades, and they're positive carry trades. It's highly unusual to have assets that tick all three boxes. When you do, you kind of have to back up the bus. And so, so yes, I think we have started a new structural bull market for, uh, for energy, a new structural bull market for, for emerging markets. And frankly, nobody's participating yet. You know, very few institutions are in it because most of them can't because of ESG constraints, because, because they just got done divesting all their energy assets. So for them to turn around and, and now do it. Yeah. So I think, I think to me, it's a, it's a trade that definitely has legs. That makes sense. And then I guess on the emerging market, so you mentioned a few of the countries that maybe are unexpectedly doing well during this time, minus China. So I'm just wondering, I wasn't going to get into your views on China yet, but we might as well now. So what do you think is the best way investors can get exposure to emerging markets? I know there's a couple of funds that I hold, IEMG and VWO. Those are two big emerging market ETFs, but they have China as a large allocation. So I think it's hard for retail investors to get exposure to emerging markets and cherry pick certain sectors or markets. It usually comes with China being the top exposure. Yeah. If you're going to buy a broad emerging market equity fund, you are going to end up with a lot of China, just because that's a, it's such a big part of the benchmark. Now, you can buy individual country funds. You know, you have ETFs for Brazil, ETFs for Korea, ETFs for India, ETFs for Singapore. So, that, you know, that you, you can do that sort of cherry pick by country. Uh, and you can either do it on momentum screens or valuation screens. So that's one option. When it comes to China, look, China at this point, you know, the equity market has been in a terrible bear market for, for the past three, four years. You know, you have... I, what I think are pretty world-class companies like Alibaba or Tencent or, or others that are, or JD, whatever, that are trading at, you know, very attractive valuations, especially relative to similar companies in the Western world. But it remains a policy-driven market, you know, and deep down, the big problem with policy in China is that you can't forecast, you can only adapt. And so, you know, buying China through ETFs on that front is, is challenging. You know, who's, who's to say tomorrow morning Xi Jinping wakes up and decides to go after Alibaba? And that's your biggest holding, right? You know, nobody knows that until he does it. Now, you could say, well, he's already done that, so he's not going to do it again. So maybe Alibaba is safe, but maybe Tencent isn't and, and so on. So, look, I think the, my take on China at this stage is pretty simple. We've just started the, the party, the 20th Party Congress. 
it's going to go on for the next week. And there's re no real reason, I think, to, to jumpstart anything until we know more. Uh, and we'll know a whole lot more in the next 10 days. Uh, specifically, I think there's, there's three big questions that surround this party Congress. The first uh, important question is what happens politically in China? Uh, does Xi Jinping concentrate all political power around him? That's option one, which isn't bullish at all for Chinese um, asset prices. Or does the Chinese Communist Party manage to bring Xi Jinping back somewhat towards what China used to be, which was management by committee uh, before Xi Jinping arrived? You know, it's most likely that, uh, you know, it will be one man rule more than management by committee, but there could be a positive surprise there. The second big question is what does the government do about the real estate market, uh, which, you know, remains this huge overhang. Although in that res in regards, you know, everybody's always asking questions about the Chinese real estate market and worried about it, et cetera. Meanwhile, real estate markets are struggling everywhere. It's not like the Canadian real estate market is flying and the UK real estate market is looking downright ugly. Uh, so, you know, why, chi why people keep focusing on China is, is interesting to me, but there's the uh, same story in Australia, same story in New Zealand. I mean, you, you look most places, the, the real estate, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see how well the US real estate market does with a 7% mortgage rate. So, Anyway, cut a long story short, I think the, the real estate question is, is increasingly a global question, although on China, we'll probably have some answers in the coming weeks. And then the third big question, of course, is the zero COVID. You know, does, does China stick with, with the zero COVID or do they get on with the rest of the world? So just on those big tech names like Alibaba, Tencent, JD, so you mentioned what we should kind of listen for and pay attention to going forward. And I guess what in your view would be positive because you also mentioned they're just trading so attractive right now they're very very low alibaba is below its ipo still i believe and so yep. it's hard not to want to buy something like that but i guess in your view what would be that positive catalyst where it would signal that it is maybe those risks are behind us or there isn't with the chinese government so on the political side on the first question does xi jinping become dictator for life and or how are his powers somewhat sort of constrained by the, the the Chinese Communist Party what I'm looking for is who gets appointed premier right now the premier is a gentleman called Li Keqiang who's having to retire he's, he's aged out and Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping have clashed a, a fair amount and so the big question is does Li Keqiang now get replaced with a Xi Jinping crony uh, and if he does then you know that's basically game over. Xi Jinping controls all the levers of power. Uh, or does he not get replaced by a Xi Jinping crony, uh, which would be, I think, a signal of the, the party still has, you know, some say in, in decision making. So that to me will be a, you know, a sort of big signpost. And I'm not going to forecast. I mean, there's no point. I'd look stupid. It's coming out in a week. But more importantly, you know, nobody can know what goes on inside uh, the standing committee of the, of the Communist Party. It's very tightly held secrets. So, you know, we wait. Uh, I often like to say in China, you're not paid, especially in Chinese politics, you're not paid to forecast, you're paid to adapt. I think right now the market is priced in for Xi Jinping being emperor for life. Uh, so if you get anything that looks a bit different, then I think the markets will, will rally a good bit. So again, so the first question is who gets who gets to be premier? The second thing will be whether there's any announcements on COVID and if they are, what are they? You know, do they sound hawkish or do they sound fairly dovish? You know, on the positive sign here, it looks like they might be easing up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you saw the October 1st holiday, which is their national holiday. You know, there's always a big parade on Tiananmen Square and none of the leadership were wearing masks and neither were the policemen, etc. So that was the first time in like two and a half years Xi Jinping was without a mask. And, and then, of course, you know, he's he's just started to travel abroad again, which is, you know, somewhat encouraging. And then finally, Hong Kong is reopening, uh, which could also be a sign that maybe they're thinking of loosening, they're trying it out in Hong Kong, see how that works and, and bringing it in. So it'll be interesting to see basically what happens on that front. Uh, on the real estate side, I think the big challenge in China on the real estate side is that you've obviously had a lot of property developers go bust. Uh, in the past uh, 18 months or so. And, you know, th this has absolutely crushed animal spirits. Because um, if you were a property developer and, you know, I'm a guy buying an apartment, the way it works in China is, you know, I, I come into your office, you show me some nice drawings, 
I say, this looks good. I'll put 20% down. And you say, okay, come back in 18 months. I'll have your apartment ready. But if you go bust in the process, then I lose my 20% through really no fault of my own, right? And so now what happens is because this, this has occurred too many times, people are just terrified at the thought of losing their 20%, which you know represents most of their people's most of people's life savings because usually the last 70% you mortgage. So this has led to a complete deep freeze of the real estate uh, transactions. Nobody's doing anything. Transaction numbers have absolutely collapsed. So what you need to do is do what we did in the Western world where the banks failed in the 1930s to the government stepped in and said, I'll guarantee bank deposits to make sure that people didn't take their money out of the bank. I think today the, the Chinese government needs to do an FDIC-like insurance company, a government-controlled insurance company that guarantees the deposits of people's uh, real estate purchases. Uh, and if you do that, then you have a chance of getting real estate uh, going again. Because China has one thing going for it relative to the US or Canada or most places right now is the fact that you know real estate are still pretty low. In fact, you know mortgage rates in, in China are about as low as they've ever been. So if you can just get animal spirits going again, then you, then you have a chance of stabilizing real estate and perhaps getting it going again. Yeah, no, that was a really helpful outlook. I think there's obviously lots of unknowns around that economy and that is your wheelhouse. So that was really great hearing that from you. I kind of want to use this as a segue now to talk about how we should position ourselves during this time. You recently published a book titled Avoiding the Punch, Investing in Uncertain Times. I really enjoyed reading it. It was all about oh, yeah. how to build a portfolio during this time of low interest rates, stretched valuations. And so I kind of wanted to get into that a little bit with you today. In your book, you mentioned there are six categories that make up a well-built portfolio. I was wondering if you could just walk us through those and kind of explain some examples of assets that fall into those categories. Absolutely. So part of the idea, I guess the first concept I go through in the book actually, is that you have to imagine your portfolio as you would a rugby team or an American football team. If you build, put an American football team together, everybody's got a very specific job, right? You don't expect everybody on your team to look like Tom Brady, nor do you expect everybody to look like an offensive lineman. And the same is true for, I, in the book, I use a rugby team because I'm a rugby player myself, but it works for, the, for just as well with American football. And given that your audience is probably North America and I'll, uh, I'm not gonna use rugby terms with which they're, they're probably not, not too familiar. But if you think of your portfolio as an American football team, you know, you wouldn't expect your quarterback to be the best tackler in the team, nor would you expect an offensive lineman to run the 100 meters in 10.5 seconds. I mean, it's great if he can, but that's not what he's being paid for. And the same is, is true of a portfolio. So just like in an American football team, you need lots of different assets that do different things at different time. This is what you need in a well-built portfolio. And I think the problem is, you know, you, you get in a bull market, people forget that. People forget that and they end up buying a lot of the same things. So, you know, a portfolio that had a lot of Apple and a lot of Microsoft and a lot of Google and a lot of Facebook, it was just the same bet over and over again. It was just buying similar type companies that basically were responded to the same kind of macro developments. So it was almost as if you're trying to put a, field, a team on the field with 11 Tom Brady's. You know, you're never going to win a long game with 11 Tom Brady's on the field. You know, as great as Tom Brady might be, and perhaps the greatest football quarterback that's ever left, a team with 11 Tom Brady's isn't get, getting you anywhere. So with that said, uh, a well-built portfolio is built around six separate blocks. The first is your anti-fragile block. What is literally your, your offensive line? Uh, it's there to protect everybody else. It's there to protect your running backs. It's there to protect your quarterback. Yeah, it's there to protect everybody. Historically, your anti-fragile building blocks were government bonds, right? And the big challenge is that, and this is what I go through in the book, the offensive line, uh, your, anti, your government bonds, it's like they went off on holiday weighing 350 pounds and they came back weighing 150 pounds. Uh, and who needs a 150 pound offensive lineman? And that's what government bonds became because they had, they had such low yields that they couldn't possibly do the job you would expect them to do. Um, now, the good news is 
this might be in the process of getting solved. You know, as yields rise, bonds will get to valuations where once again, you can hope that they, they you know, they're basically back to gaining weight right now. And so you can, you might be able to pull them off the bench. But, you know, just like a team manager, when he's got a player on the pitch who can't, who's not doing his job, you got to sub him out. You got to say, okay, you're not doing your job. Go sit on the bench. Maybe you can come back in later. But for now, I'm putting somebody else back in. The big question, of course, today is, who can you put in to replace your bonds? And here, I think there's really two, two asset classes that this year have gotten the job done. The first is energy. We've talked about it. Uh, but energy is today negatively correlated to pretty much all the other asset classes. And the other is emerging market bonds that have done a, good, a halfway decent job, including Chinese government bonds that have actually held up remarkably well in spite of a lot of things, increasing uh, tensions with the West and, and, and whatever else. So that's your first building block, anti-fragile. And today it's the hardest one to match. Your second building block is your defensives. It's almost your second defensive curtain after the offensive linemen. It's like, okay, if, if they go through, we have a, a second of defensive line. So your defensives here, it's mostly stocks, but stocks that, that have a lower beta. Think of things like historically like utilities, healthcare, infrastructure, staples. Now, one point I would make today on, on this part of the portfolio is that the big shift that we have to think of is that we've gone from a deflationary environment to an inflationary environment. Now in a deflationary environment, the government is your friend. In a deflationary environment, the government protects your margins. So the government tells you, yes, yes, build this you know, power plant, build this water treatment plant, and I guarantee you, you'll get at least 10% return or, or whatever else. And, and you can you know, price, price however you want, uh, and the government sort of is, almost guarantees your margins. In an inflationary environment, the government moves from being a friend to being an enemy. In an inflationary environment, the government is going to tell you, sorry, buddy, you can't increase your electricity price. You can't increase the water price. You can't increase the toll road because, you know, otherwise the voters are going to be too upset at me. And we've seen this in Europe, right, where all the electricity companies in Europe are going bust because they're being told by the government they can't increase their prices. So in an inflationary environment, you want to own defensive companies that have as little to do with the government as possible. So I don't think you want to own, for example, healthcare. Because the, the government can say, hey, you know what, if you price this too aggressively, I'm, you know, I'm going to change your, your patents or whatever else. But you can definitely own staples. You know, the government is never going to tell Procter & Gamble, oh, you can't raise the price of deodorants. Uh, oh, you can't raise the price of shampoo. Uh, it's never going to tell Nestle, oh, you can't raise the price of the Kit Kat. You know, if Nestle wants to move the Kit Kat from $2 to $2.20 or shrink the size of the Kit Kat more likely – from 200 grams to 150 grams, there's, uh, you know, the government isn't going to get involved. Um, so that's your second block, the, the defensives. And I would say there's defensives for inflationary environments and defensives for deflationary environments. So you got to be careful as which one you choose. Your third block, so I'm going from most defensive to most aggressive. Your third block is having a, some income, some high income producing assets in a portfolio is a very good way to stabilize returns over the long term to reduce the volatility and frankly to reduce your your own you know when when things go really badly and you you might be tempted to sell things right at the bottom having income that's coming in allows you to breathe i think it's just it's more about mental health the income portfolio is more about mental health than anything and then, you know there's there's many different ways to produce income. You can do it in the high yield space. You can do it in real estate. You can do it, of course, with high dividend yield paying stocks, many ways to produce income. But for me, the income bu bucket is first and foremost about mental health, helping you to not panic at the bottom. So then, then you get to the growth part of the portfolios. And here there's really two different types of companies. You have companies that grow through increases in price. Energy stocks are the perfect example. You know, Exxon Mobil makes a whole lot of money when the oil price is at 85 bucks and a whole lot less when it's at 55 bucks. And so the, the real variable for Exxon Mobil isn't how much oil are they going to sell, it's at what price are they going to sell it. Now, the problem is a lot of the price sensitive growth equities are 
you know, they don't, they seldom control the price. That becomes extremely macro driven. So that's your, your fourth bucket. And then you have your growth uh, volume price, where basically the growth of the stocks depend more, not on the price at which it's going to sell, but at, at the volumes at which it's, uh, it's going to sell. Uh, here, you know, perfect example is Microsoft. What matters to, to Microsoft is perhaps not as much the price at which they, they sell their licenses but the amounts of the numbers at which they're, they're going to sell them. So basically growth at price and growth at volume. Those are fourth and fifth. And the last bucket, which you don't really need actually, I do it because it, it fits well with my own temperament. It's the contrarian bucket. Markets are manic depressives. And every now and then markets will just throw up some assets it might be a given company because they're disgusted with the management. It might be a given country because of you know poor leadership in that country. It might be a commodity. It might be whatever. But at, you know sometimes it can't be given away cheap enough. It's just like the market wants absolutely nothing to do with it. And sometimes it's for very good reason, which is why I said you don't need the contrarian bucket. It's a bucket where you can easily break your teeth. Having said that, it's also one where you can have really outsized returns. And it's also one where when you get it right, it is so exciting. It is just so much fun. Uh, so yeah, those are for me the, the six buckets. I think whenever I buy an asset, I try to be very clear in my own head. Okay, we're in my own portfolio out of these six buckets is this asset going into, number one. And number two, is it a return to the mean trade? Is it a momentum trade or is it a carry trade? What's important when you buy things is you know why you buy them. And you want to make sure as you make your grid of you know your six boxes and your three reasons why you buy them, that you don't end up too skewed one way and into just one part, right? If you put this on an Excel, you, you want to be a little bit a little bit everywhere. Otherwise, it means that you have a team with 11 Tom Brady's, which might work great for a little bit, but 11 Tom Brady's isn't never going to win you the Super Bowl. Super helpful. Thanks for going into all that detail yeah, sure. on the different buckets and everything. That was, yeah, that was really great. I want to also talk to you about your four quadrant framework that you talk about in the book. And you've kind of already touched on it today by talking about the inflationary versus deflationary environments. So for our listeners, can you just explain what the four quadrant framework is and how it can be used to inform investment decisions? Absolutely. So I would tell your listeners to grab a pen and paper and do an X axis and a Y axis. On your X axis, you put growth. And on your Y axis, you put inflation. And growth and inflation are basically your two drivers of, of earnings. They're what's, they're, and you know, if you're driving earnings, you're somewhat driving returns. Now, they're the drivers of earnings and they're the drivers of interest rates. The more growth and the more inflation you have, the higher the interest rates are going to be. And of course, the lower the growth and the lower the inflation, the lower the interest rates. Now, you know, most asset prices are a stream of future earnings discounted by an interest rates on which you tack on a risk premium. So the, the four quadrant framework, basically focusing on growth, on, on the interaction with growth uh, with inflation gives you a picture of both the stream of future earnings and the interest rate on which it's going to be discounted. It doesn't give you, tell you anything about the risk premium, but it's already two out of the three parts you need for your equation. So in that interaction between growth and inflation, you start off, if you go at the very top left bottom, you start off with a deflationary bust, falling inflation, falling growth. This is the 1930s in the US. This is 2008, 2009 crisis. This is Japan following their 1990 real estate bust. Most of Asia in 1997 during the Asian crisis. Um, you know, during that period, during periods where growth is falling and inflation is falling, really the only thing you want to own are the world's safest government bonds. So typically U.S. Treasuries. And it's uh, you know these are grim economic times. Like I said, the 1930s in, in the U.S. or Canada, it's it's really not fun. Now let's move one over to the right, where now all of a sudden you have falling inflation, but rising economic growth, disinflationary boom or deflationary boom, however you want to call it. And this is actually the natural state of capitalism. This is where when people are left unhindered, this is where capitalism ends up. 
Why? Because when you think of it, most businessmen, every morning they show up at work, they try to do more with less, right? They want to produce more stuff with fewer workers, fewer inputs, fewer, you know, they try to play with their machines so that they can produce more. So the natural state of capitalism is always to produce more with less, which brings you to naturally to a deflationary boom. And a deflationary boom is extremely positive for growth stocks, especially the growth volume stocks I was describing earlier, the ones that don't depend on price, but depends on volume. That's when, you know, you those boom. And, you know, that's really what we've had for, for most of the past 30 years. We've had some interruptions, of course, during that time, but most of the past 30 years in North America, we were in a deflationary boom. Now let's go one above, uh, the inflationary boom, where I think we've been more or less up until recently, and now we're starting to move to towards the inflationary bust. But first, the inflationary boom. Inflationary boom is you've got strong growth, strong inflation. Typically, commodities that during that time are absolutely booming. Uh, so you want to be long commodities. You want to be long commodity currencies like like the Canadian dollar, like the Australian dollar. You want to be long emerging markets because emerging markets tend to be more inefficient producers. So during inflationary booms, there's not enough to go around. So your more inefficient producers actually get re-rated because all of a sudden they they stand a chance. So the, the inflationary boom is, yeah, it's usually pretty good for commodities, emerging markets, that kind of thing. And then finally, you get to the inflationary bust, which is also pretty bad news. You get falling, falling economic growth with rising inflation. You know, another name for it, of course, is stagflation. Now, of course, that's that that's the fear today on on everybody's mind, and you know during during that time you need you basically need to be in cash and the safest currencies uh, or in gold. That's the four quadrant framework. That was great. Thanks for going over that with us. So the inflationary bust. It seems like you just mentioned we're kind of in that, if not heading towards that environment. So you mentioned gold there. We haven't touched on that yet. Some investors might be wondering why gold hasn't performed that well, or maybe as well as expected. Can you talk a little bit about your outlook for gold? Look, there's no doubt that I think the performance of gold this year is disappointing, right? I think if most people had been told a year and a half ago, you know, we'd be on on the verge of World War III, potential nuclear nuclear war with 8.5% uh, U.S. inflation rates, they wouldn't have expected gold to be down. But here we are now. You know, the first point one could make, of course, is we've had an environment of very, very strong U.S. dollar. So gold has done fine in pretty much every currency except uh, except the U.S. dollar. You know, if, for, you know, if you're Canadian, gold is roughly flat for the year. If you're European, if you're Japanese, it's up a lot. So if you're European, gold has done its job for you. If you're Japanese, gold has done its job for you. It really hasn't done its job if you're American. Now, you know, I think that for me, the main explanation for this is that we now live in a world where most of the physical demand for gold comes from emerging markets. You have roughly 30% that comes from China, roughly a big third that comes from the Indian subcontinent, probably about 15% that comes from the Middle East, about 10% that comes from Russia. So most of the physical gold demand is emerging market related. And so, you know, one of the points I've made a lot to, over the past really 20 years is that we should now see gold as a proxy for emerging markets. When emerging markets do well, as they did from 2001 to 2011, the gold booms, because, you know, every guy getting richer in Jakarta or Bangkok or Beijing or Lahore or wherever else, he'll take his savings and he'll put it into gold. By the same token, when your, tip, your average businessman, your small businessman in Delhi or in Colombo or in Rangoon struggles, then he's going to sell his gold, which is, you know, how he keeps his savings. He's going to sell his gold to to make ends meet. Now, today we know that you have actually, as it turns out, two of the economies in the Indian subcontinent that are literally imploding before our eyes. Sri Lanka being one of them, Pakistan being, being the other. And as these economies implode, I think what you're seeing is people there having to sort of fire sell their gold. 
And so the bottom line is I'm, I'm, I'm a bull on emerging markets, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think as, as it becomes clearer that emerging markets are coming out of this current crisis ahead, as we start a new bull market in emerging markets, we'll probably start an, a bull market on gold as well. Uh, for me, it's one and the same. But at the end of the day, gold is more or less a way uh, it's it's sort of a it's become a low beta play on emerging markets. I think there's there's more exciting things to own than gold, but I know that a lot of people you know find emerging markets a little too exciting. So gold is not a bad halfway house. Okay, and then I'm interested to talk about deflation because in your last chapter of your book, you talk about where will deflation come from. There's kind of a debate among people if we're going to be heading towards kind of a deflationary environment eventually. Right now, obviously, inflation is still running hot and hotter than expected with the new September data just released. So I'm just wondering how you think about that deflation piece. Do you think that's coming? And will we move into that kind of cycle? I don't. I don't. Look, I've, I've been an inflationista for a while. I, I remain it. I think behind today's inflation rate, you have a number of factors. Uh, you know, the crazy fiscal and monetary policies that we followed in recent years is definitely a big one. But for me, the, the biggest factor is deglobalization. Uh, I think the the major deflationary force of the past 20 years was our ability to basically go to China and benefit from China's structural excess capital spending and their excess of workers. Um, now, that excess of workers in China has now disappeared. You know, China's demographically now looks horrible. Uh, you, China last year lost 4 million workers. By the end of this decade, it'll be losing 10 million workers a year. So, you know, the ability to, in essence, turn to China and say, look, I want you to produce this at a very low price. And China's ability to say, yes, you know, I can give you first world infrastructure and first world workers, because they were first world workers um, at third world prices. Uh, all that has been, you know, blown out of the water. It's it, like that, that's that's finished. Um, and not only is it finished, but we're, we're actually making it worse. You know, as we speak, the U.S. has told China and all the countries around the world, nobody's allowed to sell semiconductors to China anymore, which, you know, is going to wreck new havoc in supply chain. But if you're China and you think, OK, the U.S. is coming after me economically, you know, now if you're the Chinese government, you have to be telling all your auto manufacturers, guys, the U.S. is after us. So forget semiconductors. Just make sure you don't use anything from the U.S., right? Um, so let's use chemical products as an example. You know, you have about $3,000 worth of chemical products in a car. Well, right now, if I'm a Chinese auto manufacturer and I was getting this from DuPont or Dow Chemical, I'm now either looking for a local replacement or I'm going to buy it from BASF or whoever. Now, the reason I was buying it from DuPont or Dow Chemical was either that it was better or that it was cheaper. Um, or either way, it helped me get a better product at a better price. But now with, you know, this latest thing from the U.S., if I'm a Chinese producer, um, I've got to basically cut back all my product importing from the U.S., not just semiconductors, everything. Because if tomorrow the U.S. decides no more chemical products for China, then my whole business is going to implode. Um, so I got to prepare for it now before it happens. Uh, so, you know, the, the rise, I would say, of geopolitical protectionism, because that's, that, that's what it is, or what I've called in the, my books, uh, the, the, the age of weaponization, where everybody weaponizes their, their one comparative advantage to try to trip up the next guy. You know, all this points to, to lower productivity, and lower productivity means lower growth at higher prices. So, no, I think we're, we're in a, you know, we're, we are now heading to a much structural higher uh, rate of inflation, unfortunately, but it's the case. And then I guess everything with energy prices as well, um, with OPEC cutting supply, I mean, it, prices were going down for a little bit, but it's definitely not the case anymore. So we can probably expect energy prices to be at least in near term and maybe long term push for inflation as well. I think so. Um, I, I very much think so. As you pointed out, energy prices came back down, I think, thanks to two things. First, you had the Chinese lockdown, and then you had the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserves. You know, I think um, most people, my, myself included, I'll put my hand up to this one, I was very much hoping that 
post the Chinese Olympics in January, uh, we'd see China reopening, right? And instead, we got the, the Shanghai lockdown, uh, which you know came very hard, like two hard months of, of lockdown in, in Shanghai, which you know was came as quite a shock to, to everyone. So you had the Chinese lockdown, which probably took about a million and a half barrels out of global oil demand. And right at the same time, the U.S. turned around and said, look, we're going to release strategic petroleum reserves. We're going to release roughly 800,000 barrels per day. So increase supply lower demand, obviously you've got constrained prices. But will we still have these two factors in three months time? Uh, well, we definitely won't have any more strategic petroleum reserves uh, releases because you can't release it forever, right? In three months time, the, the US won't have oil to release. Uh, so that'll be that. And if, it's a, if at that point, China comes back onto the system and says, yep, I'll have another million and a half barrels per day, please. Where will that million and a half barrel per day come from? I don't know. Yep. That is the question. I also want to talk to you. Um, this will be the last question for today about China de-dollarizing their economy. So I've heard you talk about this before, and I was hoping that you could kind of explain what this means and maybe what the implications this could have for U.S. and global markets. Absolutely. Look, I think if you're China, you know, I, I always like to tell my clients, we shouldn't criticize Xi Jinping until we've walked a mile in their shoe, in his shoes, right? See, it's the old Steve Martin quote: "You, you don't criticize anyone before you walked a mile in their shoes, because like this, when you do, you're a mile away and you have their shoes." And so, when we look at Xi Jinping, you know, f for him, from where he's sitting, the U.S. is out to get him. The U.S. is cutting all of the semiconductor access to China, keep making threatening noise. You know, you got U.S. officials visiting Taiwan, which is like against the status quo that has been established for 50 years. So, you know, he feels they're out to get me. Now that he feels this, he thinks, okay, how? so how are they going to do it? Well, there's three ways the U.S. can trip up China. Uh, the first is indeed by banning semiconductors. Well, they've already done that. So, you know, I don't have much choice. I got to spend a fortune building my own semiconductor industry. So be it. I, you know, I just don't, don't have a choice. So, so that's number one. Number two, the second thing the U.S. can do to China is they can cut me off energy. But here, this is getting hard for them to do uh, because China's doing long-term deals with Russia, doing long-term deal with Kazakhstan. China has now become the world's leader in solar industry. It's rapidly building a lot of nuclear power plants. So on the energy front, they're trying to basically cut themselves off ocean imported, ocean imported energy because of course the US controls the oceans, right? Or at least reduce the dependency on the amount of ocean imported energy. But then where China's greatest weakness is, of course, is uh, on the energy front, uh, sorry, on the uh, currency front. The fact that most of China's foreign trade is still denominated in US dollars. And that, you know, the US does have a track record of tripping up its enemies by weaponizing the US dollar. Uh, the US did this against Venezuela. The US did this against Iran. Uh, the US is now doing it, of course, against Russia. The US turns around and says, well, look, the US dollar is our currency and we don't like you, so you're not allowed to use it anymore. And anybody who uses the U.S. dollar with you will fall under U.S. sanctions. So if you're China, you now have to de-dollarize your economy as quickly as you possibly can. And that means trying to convince most of your trade partners to switch from using the U.S. dollar to anything else. But of course, preferably the renminbi, since China controls the renminbi. Now, China has been trying to do this for 10 years with very limited success up until the Ukraine war. Uh, I think the Ukraine war actually changes the equation somewhat in that at least now you have Russia, Russia that always was a little bit reluctant on trading in renminbi, but now because Russia itself has been kicked off the US and Euro systems, Russia has no choice but to embrace the renminbi, right? It's sort of beggars can't be choosers kind of thing. And so now all of a sudden you have the world's largest commodity exporter namely Russia, trading with the world's largest commodity importer, namely China, a trade all of which used to happen in US dollars, now happening in renminbi. Now this is, I think, quite a big game changer because that trade you know will never go back to being in US dollars. So if you look at it this way, before when China wanted to buy a billion dollars worth of iron ore or copper or coal or whatever else from Russia, it first needed to go to the US and earn a billion dollars. So it first needed to go out and sell a bunch of 
I don't know, bicycles or plastic toys or shoes or you name it, earn a billion dollars. Then it could take that billion dollar to China and say, uh, to Russia and say, please give me a, you know, a billion dollars worth of iron ore. And now all of a sudden Russia says, no need to do this. Just print a billion renminbi in your basement and send it over to us. So this is a huge, huge improvement for China. You know, it's a, and, and as a result, Russian Chinese trade is actually booming. You know, a few years ago, China was buying about 4 billion a month of commodities from Russia. Now it's about 12 billion a month. And it's, it's probably going to keep growing. It also allows now China to turn to people like BHP. BHP is the, one of the world's largest uh, mining companies there uh, and the biggest iron ore miner. So they turn to BHP and they say, hey, BHP, we used to trade uh, in US dollars, but, you know, I like your stuff a lot. So your iron ore is terrific. It's much better than this Russian crap I buy. But Russia, they accept RMB. So unless you you two start to accept RMB, I'm going to do more with Russia and less with you. And so a few weeks ago, we saw BHP announce for the first time uh, RMB deal, uh, RMB for iron ore uh, deal, which was you know a first in the market. And now that BHP accepts RMB for iron ore, China won't let them go back. In fact, what's going to happen is they're going to turn to Rio Tinto and Vale, the other two big uh, iron ore miners, and say, "Hey guys." If you don't accept RMB as well, we're going to do more with Russia and more with BHP and less with you. So I think the, you know, China, the Ukraine war has been, a, you know, obviously it's a humanitarian disaster and it's, uh, you know, nobody wins in a war. But if anybody wins out of this war, for me, it's China because it's allowed them to, to shift the needle uh, in their de-dollarization strategy in a, what I think is a fairly meaningful way. I guess just quickly then, can you explain what impact that has for the U.S. dollar then? Obviously, that'll cause it to depreciate, but I think so. Like, how soon could we see that happen? So let me tell you a personal experience. So back in, back in 2008, 2009, I set up a fund with a friend of mine called Mark Hart. And our view was pretty simple, was Europe was cruising for a bruising. The way the euro constructed uh, made no sense. And that pretty soon countries like Greece and Italy and Portugal that were all borrowing at the same rate of Germany wouldn't, would no longer be, be able to. And that you'd see a blowout in European spreads. So we went out and we bought a bunch of credit default swaps in Greece and uh, in Italy, etc. And one of the other bets we made was to say, okay, and as Europe economically hits the wall, the euro will go down. Uh, so we bought a bunch of puts on the euro. Okay. So we had the credit default swaps and those did great. You know, we, as the spreads, you know, as Europe started to hit the, the wall, you saw spreads on Greece explode. You saw spreads on Italy explode. Um, and so, you know, these were re-rated massively and we made lots of money there. And then the Euro puts, we lost our shirt on. The Euros went from 120 in 2010 to 150 in 2011. Even as the markets, even as you know, Europe was falling apart. I mean, it was obvious that, that, that Europe was, was collapsing. At the time, I talked about it with my dad, and my dad had run a macro fund in the 90s. And he said, that's nothing. If you think you've got pain, try being short Japan in the 90s. So for, for those listeners who don't know, Japan had a huge bubble, probably the, the, the most historical bubble of all bubbles in, in the 1980s. You actually had a shop in Ginza that sold for over a million US dollars a square foot. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's how big a bubble it was. So it was the, the, the bubble to end all bubbles. And then when it imploded in 1990, it was pretty obvious that, that Japan would, would have a lost decade, right? It, it was, it'd be terrible. So a lot of people, including my dad, shorted the, the Nikkei and shorted the yen. And the Nikkei part went great, you know, the market lost 50% and then kept falling. And it was, so that, that part was great. And the yen went from 160 to 85, um, which means it went up because the, you know, the, the yen is inverted. Um, so the yen actually went up as it went from 160 to 85. Now, the reason I, illust I highlight this is that when you have a bubble and a bubble blows up, which is what we had in Europe, which is what we had in uh, Japan, it leaves financials, financial companies with big holes. And whether your pension funds, your insurance companies, your, your corporates themselves, 
they have big holes in their balance sheets, uh, you know, big holes in their income statements, and they they need to plug them. Uh, and the fastest and easiest way to plug them is to sell foreign assets and repatriate capital. And so, you know, often what you can see after a bubble implosion is the currency go up, and it can go up quite strongly because there's nobody to take the other side. Nobody is is taking the other side. Nobody's while the the, the economy is slowing following the bubble implosion, nobody's pushing capital outside. Everybody's bringing it back. So everybody's on the same same side of the trade. The reason I highlight this is we've just had an epic bubble implosion in the US. We're still in the middle of it. A, a fixed income bubble, a crypto bubble, a real estate bubble, a equity market bubble. It was an everything bubble. You got to believe that when you look at the 15, 16 trillion of capital destruction that you've had in the United States, a lot of that is sitting on the books of insurance companies, of pension funds. Um, and so I think what they're doing right now is repatriating capital, repatriating capital to plug the holes. Uh, and this explains the parabolic move in, uh, in the U.S. dollar. Now, these things, you know, when they get started, they can continue for quite a while. So I'm not, I'm not inclined to try to top take this. Having said that, if you ask me for a structural view over the next four or five years, not the next three months, then yes, you know, this de-dollarization of global trade away from the U.S. dollar is extremely bearish, the U.S. dollar, because once it happens, it's not coming back. Um, and of course, the biggest comparative advantage of the U.S. is the fact that everybody else uses the U.S. dollar to fund most of their trade. The fact that when China buys lumber from Canada or coal from Canada or oil from Canada, that it's priced in US dollars. You know, why, why does it need to be priced in US dollars, right? Uh, it's, it's like having a ménage à trois. It's like, you know, why can't it be just in, either in Canadian dollars or, or, or renminbi? But of course, the fact that it's in US dollars allows the US to, it's the exorbitant privilege. It allows the US to, to live far above its means for, for a very long time. And when that ends, then the I would say the, the you know the the cost of living adjustment in the U.S. will be will be quite drastic. I do think U.S. policymakers are playing with fire. I wish we could have ended on a happier note there, but that's <laughs> the reality of the markets today. Thank you so much for sharing all those insights with us. That was so great. I know that I learned a lot from this conversation. Before I let you go, can you let our listeners know where they can learn more about you, your work, and then everything that you do? Sure. Um, so I don't, I'm not really on social media, so I, I apologize for that. So we publish research mostly for institutional investors, and we do that out of our website, gafkal.com, G-A-V-E-K-A-L.com. We also have a free newsletter. So you mentioned that you've already interviewed my colleague and very close friend, David Hay. So David runs the, the private wealth arm of Gafcal called Evergreen Gafcal. And Evergreen Gafcal does publish a bunch of free newsletters that retakes uh, sometimes some of the stuff we publish at Gafcal. I myself, I try to publish a book every 18 months or so, if, if only to sort of clear my mind about what I'm really thinking. It's, I, I find it a, a cathartic exercise in, in terms of structuring my thoughts. Those books are always available for sale on our website. Sometimes, like after, after a few years, you can download them for free, the e-version. Otherwise, they're like 15 or 20 bucks. And I, re I did publish one not that long ago called Avoiding the Punch. I haven't started working on the new one yet, taking it easy for a little bit. Another thing we do, so we, we also have a, an institutional money management arm, mostly money, invest money in Asia. Uh, so we have Asian Equities Fund, Chinese Fink's uh, Income Fund. We do manage one Asian government bond ETF. For anybody who's interested in exposure to Asian government bonds, the, the ticker is AGOV, A-G-O-V. So, yeah, and if people want to reach out to me, I'm uh, louis at gafcal.com. Awesome. Thank you so much again for taking the time to chat with us today. My pleasure. If you establish goals to help you realize the importance of the money and why you're accumulating, and then you establish rules that help you eliminate unnecessary mistakes, I think you're gonna start to see a lot more success in your long-term strategy and probably reduce some anxiety that you might be facing.